Cardiogenic shock is pump failure shock. And a common cause of this is that part of the myocardium becomes infarcted as a result of a coronary thrombosis. So let's think about this in terms of the coronary arterial perfusion of the myocardium. And if we do this same sort of diagram that we do many times with an arterial branch, dividing into smaller arterial branches, and then this could be a, an area of myocardium here, an area of myocardium here, supplied by the arterial branch. Now, one of the problems in Western societies is that atheroma starts accumulating, atheromatous plaque start accumulating very often at the bifurcation of arterial branches. So we develop this fatty atheroma. And if this fatty atheroma becomes unstable and the surface of it ruptures, that means that the thrombogenic core of the atheromatous plaque is in contact with the platelets that are in the blood. And disruption of the roof of the atheromatous plaque, when the plaque has become unstable, means that that will trigger platelet aggregation. So we can get platelet aggregation triggering here, many platelets sticking together, and we call this white thrombus. And this will reduce the blood supply to this area of myocardium. Now, if there's a moderate amount of white thrombus, we might call that low-risk unstable angina. If there was more white thrombus, that would become higher-risk unstable angina. So the patient gets the normal coronary-type pains, the heaviness, the constriction, very bad chest pain because of the occlusion of the, the blood supply there by the platelets all clumping together, white thrombus. But the reason it's called high-risk unstable angina is that there is a risk that the blood supply will become much less and if there's a lot more white thrombus then you'll get what you call a, a non STEMI, a non ST elevation myocardial infarction. And a non STEMI, a non ST myocardial infarction can go on and instead of the platelets forming there you start getting red blood clot, proper blood clot a blood clot thrombosis and that's going to cause ST elevation myocardial infarction and this area of heart muscle will be cut off from its blood supply, it will die and of course the dead tissue does not contribute towards the overall contractility of the myocardium. So we want to prevent this and at the white thrombus stage in unstable angina or non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, do this by giving drugs to make the platelets less sticky. For example, aspirin, chlorpidogrel, which some people call clopidogrel, it's the same thing. Heparin, probably subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin as an anticoagulant. So the aim is to stop the unstable angina or the non-STEMI progressing onto STEMI. If it has already progressed onto STEMI, then we need to go for thrombolysis to dissolve the thrombus, to actually break this thrombus up, to dissolve it. If that's done at an early stage, as soon as possible, that will allow the blood supply to go back to the infarcted area of myocardium. It will reperfuse it and, and that area of myocardium will, will not die or massively smaller numbers of myocardial cells will die if we give early thrombolysis. So it's preventing the, uh, the death of the myocardium to prevent the cardiogenic shock from happening. Now, valvular problems are much harder to, to treat. Um, surgery might be appropriate for correction of valvular dysfunction. Dysrhythmias, we often treat these in the medical A&E type of context. For example, a patient could be in atrial fibrillation. That can reduce the pumping efficiency of the heart. We might treat that with drugs or even with anaesthetizing the patient and then defibrillating them. Or we might get a ventricular arrhythmia, ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, for example. And these are actually essentially forms of cardiac arrest. Well, ventricular fibrillation, of course, is a cardiac arrest. With a ventricular tachycardia, the patient may or may not be unconscious. 
after trauma, where there's been massive bl blood loss, you might get um, pulseless electrical activity, where you get a, a normal ECG, but no um, contraction of the myocardium. In the old days, we used to call it electromechanical dissociation. So when you can see a normal ECG, but there's no cardiac output, there's nothing in the carotid arteries or the femoral arteries, and the patient's lost a lot of blood, can consider this pulseless electrical activity. These are forms of cardiac arrest. So, for example, with the ventricular fibrillation, we would treat that with um, defibrillation, with, with DC shock, providing the patient was unconscious, pulseless, and ventricular fibrillation was seen on the ECG screen. So, correcting dysrhythmias. Medications, of course, this is the whole field of cardiology, really. Medications to correct the pathology that's wrong with the heart. So sometimes in critical care situations, you might give inotropes to increase the contractility of the surviving myocardium, or we give other medications to try and improve the cause of the condition. For example, angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors are very good for treating congestive heart failure.